I'm preaching on the uh, on the concept there of the false prophets. It said, "Beware of false prophets," and so that's something that uh, comes up a lot. And you know, I, I noticed like some of the the men who are well known preachers get a lot of airtime on television and and uh, and all. And if you tell somebody, "No, he's a false prophet," you know, or maybe even like you know, based on what he says about salvation, he's not even going to heaven. A lot of people freak out. Even Baptists freak out because they're just, oh, but that he's such a good person and he preaches Jesus and all that. But the Bible says certainly beware of false prophets. There's a lot of uh, prophets uh, that we know don't have the truth. And so uh, here's a couple of things I want to talk about. Number one, uh, I believe in being an independent, okay, independent Baptist. Ind- I stress independent, even more than Baptist. Like we're independent. We're not, uh, we're not under some group of people, some kind of board, you know. Well, I say I'm independent Baptist. Oh, well, you are the. Are you from? Are you of Hiles or are you of, uh, you know, Sam Davison or are you? Are, no, no, no. I'm independent, right? Amen. I might have went to this college. I might have went to this church growing up. I might have, but uh, our church is independent, and I believe that. I also believe that Baptists. I tell people this sometimes, and I hope everybody understands what I'm saying, but. In the true sense of the word, I believe Baptists are non-denominational. So what do you mean? Uh, Yeah, I don't believe that we're a denomination. Now, what happens is oftentimes uh, independent Baptist churches will start fellowshipping with some other groups, which is great. Fellowshipping is fine with like-minded believers and all, but then it becomes like an organization. Not long before that organization is, guess what? A denomination. And that's not what we're supposed to be. And I've watched it, and you know what? All these denominations, they end up failing. All these uh, movements and all that, they end up failing. Uh, but we just want to be an independent local church, all right? And I believe that, uh, and I tell people that. But look, there's a huge difference between non-denominational and interdenominational, okay? Which means we just accept all different denominations; they work together. Big difference, big difference. I don't think we're a, a denominational, but uh, we're a denomination, but we're certainly not interdenominate. I wouldn't obviously call myself non-denominational. What, here's what I think of. I brought this for an illustration. When I hear the word non-denominational, I always think about something without a label, <laughs> right? Like, you know, you're like, well, what's in there? Don't have a clue, right? Doesn't have a label. But actually, the interesting thing is, you know, non-denominational, if I see a church that says non-denominational, guess what? I see that as a denomination because <laughs> I know pretty much what they teach and what they believe. And, and so, uh, but in the true sense of the word, I still would never try to eliminate, you know, well, let's not put a name on there. We don't want people to know who we are. And like I said, I believe Baptists in the true sense of the word are, are non-denominational in the sense of, you know, hey, we don't, there's no uh, a higher board. We have, to, we have to line up with this board or whatever. But to say, we're certainly not interdenominational. And to say that like, you know, hey, we're just like generic, like that can, don't want anybody to know who we are. That's, that's absurd. I mean, we want everybody to know what we believe. So why would we try to hide that from? That's what cults do, right? That's what, like, uh, you talk to, a, I mean, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, they're always, like, changing what they call themselves and how they approach you and all that because they don't want you to know anything about, they believe, about what they believe until they get you in. And they slowly start teaching you what they believe. We want people to know right off the bat what we believe. And so, I mean, you, most people kind of get the idea when you say independent, fundamental, soul winning, <laughs> you can put all that out there. People get a pretty good idea. Uh, we're talking about changing ours to hyper soul winning. We are called that by somebody, hyper soul winning Baptist church. And, uh, and <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, people understand what you stand for and what you believe. That's not, that's not uh, a bad thing. And so I was going to title the message, the non-denominational denomination with that thought in mind that actually they're a denomination. But as I'm studying that, and I've been studying that for a while, particularly with the charismatic movement, because pretty much that's what non-denominational means. Like, we don't want to tell you that we're Pentecostal, so we'll call ourselves charismatic. No, we know what charismatic means. Okay, well, we won't call ourselves charismatic. We'll call ourselves non-denominational, right? We'll call ourselves, we won't say, uh, you know, we speak in tongues. We'll say we're empowered. <laughs> we're an empowered church. I mean, always trying to fit something to get more people in and to, uh, uh, to get some like-minded folks in. In fact, we live in a, in a time where so many Christians say, well, churches are dying. I mean, all across the world, 
You know, people, these, all these churches are shutting down and a lot of people don't believe anymore. And then I'm looking at mega churches that are growing. Just like, I mean, they're buying football stadiums and turning them into churches. And, and I'm thinking, uh, and then, you, you know, this is, that's just in the U.S. You go to, to uh, Africa, you go to South America, you go to Asia, and there are these charismatic or non-denominational churches that are growing just like uh, uh, Lakewood or whatever it is uh, where that Joe Osteen is. Uh, just huge mega churches. Guess what? Non-denominational. <laughs> but they're growing. But the, what I want to talk about is the non-denominational deception, okay? The non-denominational deception. So here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures right up front. This is all my, uh, all my scriptures. And then uh, there will be a few more scriptures afterwards, but most of them are going to come right up front, so pay attention. They're familiar. You're familiar with most of them. And then as I give the uh, main points of the text, I mean, of the sermon, you can kind of fill in the blanks. Sorry. Matthew chapter 7, as we just looked at, look at verse 21. Matthew 7, verse 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into uh, the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name have done many wonderful works? I mean, every time I read that, I think that sounds like the charismatic movement. <laughs> you know, we cast out devils, we prophesied in your name, did many wonderful works. And, uh, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And in the context of this passage, look at verse 15. Will shall come to you in sheep's clothing, but uh, inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruit. And uh, you're familiar with that passage. And so we know right off the bat, the Bible makes it clear over and over, there's going to be false prophets, and we need to watch them. They're going to be sneaky. They're going to be tricky. Uh, you're going to want to say, well, man, he believes just like me. I, I've been studying a lot on Mike, Mike Bickle and uh, in the IHOP movement and the, the whatever vineyard thing that is and, and, and all these guys. You know, actually, the Pentecostal movement started in Kansas. Yeah, it's interesting. It started in Kansas. And in fact, the guys that started that uh, Azusa Street revival that everyone's familiar with in California, if I'm, I'm going to do some more check on this, but the way I understand the story, the guy that started that in California, the reason he left Kansas to go to California is because he was found out for being a sodomite. And they, cha and they ran him out of town. I mean, look it up. <laughs> Parham or something like that is his name. And, uh, and, uh, but anyway, started in Kansas City, and then there was like a revival, so-called so revival here, uh, I don't know, in the, the 50s, 60s, I think it was, where they really just said, hey, we're going to, you know, God is just moving us. We're going to go to Kansas City, and we're going to do that. Look, they're everywhere, you know, cares, these charismatic-type uh, churches. And, uh, and so some of them sounded good. I was listening to Mike Bickle. And actually, he was defending, catch this, he was defending why every year they do this big uh, one thing. I've never really looked into exactly what that is, but the one thing where they uh, get all these mus musicians and they really just attract a huge crowd, uh, you know, get some guys out of Redding, California to come out here and play. And, you know, they're, they're just really this huge crowd. And I remember seeing this that where they had, uh, he didn't actually come, but he had the Pope. Like, and he presented some kind of a, you know, like a big screen or something like that where the, the Pope kind of gave his, his words. And, uh, and he was kind of defending how uh, the Pope actually called for like a whole bunch of, like, I think like 30 some Protestants to come sit in this like little council meeting or whatever. And he was talking to them and trying to encourage everybody to rally together against what he said was going to be the one world government and one world religion and all that that's coming. But he said it's going to be like this atheistic, you know, all these people that don't believe, or, or not just atheists, but all those who reject Christ. And so he included Muslims and all that. And they said, well, this is what that one world religion is going to be. And so we need to join forces. as Everybody who calls himself a Christian, we need to join forces in the name of Christ so that we can fight against those guys. And I'm thinking, Man, you're ushering in that one world religion right there. And he's sitting down in this conversation for like an hour, and I'm listening to it, and he's defending why he went and talked to the... 
And I realized, man, he's just real sneaky and he's slick how he how he explains it. And he's like, well, I don't know. You know, this is what he told me. But I mean, he may be behind closed doors. He says, and he just was like just so slick with his words. And I was thinking, I can see why thousands and thousands of people follow him and believe what he says and says, man, this is the place to go. And we need to uh, because he knows how to talk. And I'm not in this sermon calling him a false prophet. You know, that'll come at a later t- later date. But I'll say this. Don't be deceived just because somebody's a slick talker. You know, we're supposed to always be ready and understand that false prophets are going to come. Look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Repetitious, I know, going through Revelation and everything right now, we keep coming back to this, but... Uh, This is very important, and we need to constantly be reminded of this. Matthew 24, look at verse 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So should we be surprised if men come on the scene and claim to be Christians and they show great signs and wonders? And you know what's funny is you listen to any of those mainstream charismatic uh, preachers and they'll say, you know, hey, God is doing something great and, and the world's coming together and, and their spirit, you know, the spirit empowered movement is all over the world and it's growing like crazy. And they said, and the secret is signs and wonders. I mean, signs and wonders are bringing people to, they say, no, you can't just go out and evangelize. Or actually, sometimes they'll say, well, you can. You can win somebody with your words, but so much more effective if they see the signs and wonders. And I'm like, no, the Bible says, you know, it's greater to believe and not see, right, than to believe and see. And they're saying, no, 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 they got to see, they got to see. Well, look, we were warned that false prophets are going to come and they're going to produce these signs and wonders and they're going to deceive people. So, like, what, if I'm seeing somebody, even if they claim to be doing miracles, even if they were, how do I know? Like, I'm not going to trust that. I'm going to trust what the Bible says. So that throws the whole idea about doing these signs and wonders out the window. And they're like, no, no, the signs and wonders, that's proof, that's evidence. And they'll say all over the world, you know, all these, th- you know, Africa, China, uh, India, I mean, all these places, there's these great movements of these spirit and power. And I'm thinking all those cultures that you just mentioned are animist cultures, like spiritism cultures. <laughs> of course, they believe in signs and wonders and all that stuff. And so the whole world seems to be deceived, being deceived, and we shouldn't be surprised. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy 4, look at verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Then it talks about some things that they will preach, forbidding marriage and all that. Not They don't necessarily apply to this message, but there are seducing spirits. You understand that. And people are going to come and they're going to teach these things uh, from false spirits, you know. And so, uh, so there's the false prophets, signs and wonders, seducing spirits. Look at 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3. This know also that in the last days... So anytime we get to end times, last days, all that kind of stuff, we realize, hey, like whenever that is, we're in it. (laughs) From the time of Christ, we're in it. And, you know, my theory I've presented before is like all that means is like, hey, we're closer to the end than we were before Christ. All right. And even if I'm wrong on my theory, well, we're certainly closer to the end than we were yesterday. (laughs) We're in the last times. okay? And if we, you know, just kind of doing the math, how long it was before Christ and how long it is after Christ. Look, if we if the, the world is still here another thousand years, then my theory is wrong. <laughs> OK, but we're simply in the last times. OK, and of course, we're going to get closer and closer to the, the last of the last times. But here's what he says. Uh, he says uh, this. Know that in the last days, perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves 
covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, uh, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sin, led away with diverse lusts. I love that verse. Silly women laden with sin. But look, the idea is that those are going to creep in. They're creeps. They're going to creep into the house uh, of God. They're going to creep into denominations. They're going to creep into these places, and they're going to lead uh, some uh, people away by their their creepiness. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter four. Second Timothy chapter four, verse three. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And you see, uh, uh, these, having these itching ears, they're going to go after fables. They're going to go after those certain things that they want to believe because it sounds good. And uh, they're going to go after that rather than believing the truth. Now, I think that's the key to why these non-denominational churches are growing and booming. Why? They're not being told you know, any doctrine. They're not being told anything that's offensive. They're just, uh, they're just being, you know, uh, hey, you need to be part of this. This is a great movement. And hey, we all believe in Christ and all this kind of stuff. And then they're uh, leading people astray, no doubt about it. Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter three. <clears throat> Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it was uh, with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not the faith, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye uh, both do and will do the things which we commanded you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Now we commend you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the traditions which ye have received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread and travail night and day, uh, uh, for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might be not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we don't have the power. Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm looking at this thinking, man, these are good verses, but I, I don't think this is what I meant to, go, <laughs> meant to turn to. I'm not sure what I did there, but I'm looking for the verse that says uh, not to be deceived, lest any means some might, huh? Chapter 2, thank you. Man, so we got to read this all over again. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, now we're on the right track, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter uh, us, as at the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So I want you to notice where he says, hey, don't be deceived by any means. Any means. Don't let the signs and wonders and, uh, and, and the power, and some people will, will trick you with their, their wealth and their big buildings and their fancy, and you know just the fact that they have large numbers of people and say, hey, look, God's blessing us because we're right. No, I'm not going to be deceived by any means. We need to always be on the guard in that way. Okay, so, so if there's a great deception out there, if God said there's going to be false prophets, there's going to be deception, a lot of people are going to be deceived, we want to know, okay, how, how do people fall into this deception? I mean, what, what kind of people are going to fall? How do we need to be on our guard and all that? And so basically, there's three different ways that I want to point out that people are deceived. We see it in all those texts that I just, that I just read. Okay, these are ways in which people are deceived. Primarily, I'm talking about by this charismatic movement, 
non-denominational movement, whatever you want to call it, but uh, there's a deception. Okay, so number one is this. <clears throat> because some people are ignorant and gullible. <laughs> That's a big part of why people are deceived. They're ignorant and they're gullible. If I wanted to deceive a bunch of people, let's say I just, you know, love money, want to get money from a lot of people, or I just love power, or I want people to just, you know, whatever my motivation is, if I want to deceive a lot of people, I'm probably going to try to learn a whole lot, and then I'm going to go to the ignorant people. It kind of makes me think of those drug dealers, right? Drug dealers, you know, a lot of the drug dealers are very smart, very knowledgeable, don't touch drugs because they know it'll mess them up. <laughs> But they know how to go into certain neighborhoods and get people hooked on them and get them started on drugs and all that. And so they're profiting, right, on the knowledge that they know and the education they have and all that. And then they're, and it doesn't matter what you're talking about, sex trafficking or anything that's going on. And then they go to these like poor people and uneducated people and they pick them as their target because they're like, you know, people that aren't educated and they're ignorant, you know, they tend to be more gullible. We can talk them into things. We can get them to do whatever we want to do. Now, it's interesting. I also agree that the most receptive people, when we go preach the gospel, or are we trying to teach them a, a, a different doctrine than what they're used to hearing, are the people who are, uh, you know, poorer, have less education, right? And in a sense, it's true because they're more gullible. They'll listen to us. Now, I know we're teaching them the truth, but I'm saying that's, that's a little bit about why they will uh, uh, believe certain things. In our world, now, we think about the U.S. as being just like, I mean, I, you probably feel like, although you know better, because you you know you maybe have learned this in school or you've looked it up online, and you know that the United States represents a very small amount of the population of the world, okay? But in our hearts, in our minds, we tend to think like the you know, United States is just like everything, and this is, <laughs> this is the whole world. Well... <laughs> When these guys talk about this uh, spirit-empowered movement and how many millions of people worldwide are uh, coming to Christ and they're, you know, speaking in tongues and they're doing all this kind of stuff, they're going, like I said, to Africa. I mean, you can fit the United States like twice in Africa. I know I don't know about the population there because there's a lot of, uh, of desert and stuff, but Africa's huge. China is the most is the highest populated, or Asia, I should say, in general, highest population region in the world is in Asia. Asians are just flocking to the uh, to the charismatic movement right now. In fact, if you go out to IHOP, I think they have a whole section that's dedicated to the Oriental. If you go there, you'll see a lot of Oriental people. I mean, they were wearing the mask before COVID even hit. <laughs> and it's like just a huge population in Kansas City of Chinese and whatever are into this charismatic movement, you know. And so worldwide, you know, a lot of these people, by the way, didn't become Christians in the United States, so-called Christians in the United States. They had that from wherever they were. Philippines, man, Philippines are, there's, it's like everybody's a Christian, quote unquote, in the Philippines. Now, they actually do have a lot of Baptists in the Philippines, but, uh, but, but it's just like worldwide, there are a lot of Christians. I remember reading, uh, uh, what's it called, The Voices of the Martyr. Anybody ever heard of that? Uh, it's a magazine. I mean, I don't know. It's a whole uh, organization or something, but I saw the magazine, and it's like Voice of the Martyrs. And it goes worldwide about all the Christians that are being persecuted and they're suffering and all that. And I was like, man, I'd like to read about this. And in my mind, here's what I'm thinking. In the United States, we don't know anything about suffering. We don't know anything about persecution. Let me see what some of these Christians, you know, the persecution that they're receiving from different parts of the world. And as I read that, I'm thinking, man, there are just so many believers all over this world. And then I'm reading about them and I'm like, these people aren't saved. These aren't even Christians, right? But there are people that are claiming to be Christians all over the world, but their belief, their uh, evidence of salvation in their minds are these signs and wonders, you know, these, these, these powers. I remember watching this video, I probably shared this before, but watching this video when I was in Bible college, uh, a guy from the Ivory Coast, Cote, Cote d'Ivoire, whatever however you pronounce it. He's from the Ivory Coast, and he had this video where the uh, the native people there. He was in some obscure village, and the native people there they believe that this water, uh, uh, one time a year, this water kind of like reminds me of the story where the waters turn and the angels came down, <laughs> and that that story that went on about those that pool, right? They believe that once a year 
this river or whatever body of water it was had the special spiritual power to heal sicknesses. And what they would do is they would all have this big feast, and I don't know if they're on something, uh, drinking or whatever, but they're acting crazy, and they're dancing around. This guy's getting this all on, on film. And the guy picks up a knife, and he starts just like cutting himself, stabbing himself, and blood's coming out and everything. And then they, somebody got some water from that river or whatever and poured it on him, and it looked like, now I don't know if he's just faking it, you know, because there's a lot of that that goes on there, just total deception, you know, cause, because people are gullible. And they believe it, right? So it might have been a trick. Might have been some ketchup he had on, you know. And they poured that on there, and he's like, look, no wound. Everybody's like, oh, wow, look at the power of our gods and everything. Then they turned to this missionary, and they handed him a knife and said, hey, you do it and see if your God will heal you. And he's like, no. <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> That's, that'd be tempting God. <laughs> But the idea is that people believe that. So if you go to a place like Africa, South America, uh, you know, where there's like these witch doctors. And I remember in Japan, in Japan, you would think, hey, they're a lot more educated. Now, this was many years ago, so maybe there's been some change. I'm not sure. But I remember whenever I was in Japan, uh, last we went over there twice. My dad is in the military. So I went over there from like seven years old to... I don't know, 10 or something like that. And then later we went back from uh, 13 to 16. And that second time we were in Okinawa. And, uh, and, the, and, and so the la last time I was there was, was in the early 90s. Okay. And in the early 90s, they were still like this, but you could go off base and you could find temples. Okay. And in these temples, they had all these crazy customs. Like if you ring the bell, the gods wake up and and on their new year, whatever their new year was, they had these kind of beans that they would like throw into different corners of their household. And that would like keep the evil spirits away and all this. Look, look, the whole world has these weird beliefs as far as spiritism and stuff. And now look, I'm not denying the spiritism that we see in the Bible. There are spirits. We understand that. We wrestle. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, uh, but against principalities. I understand all that. And we don't want to ever get so educated where we don't believe in the supernatural because we do understand that uh, there's a spiritual world that is, is totally different. It's like a lot of people get so educated and they're like, I don't believe in miracles, right? I'm, I'm higher educated than that. I don't believe in that, right? Well, we understand there's going to be, if there's a God who made the laws of nature, he can, he can work around the laws of nature. We understand that. We have faith that we believe in the Bible. But look, there are people all over this world that, you know, if they're sleeping at night, and they hear a creak in the house, they think, oh, no, that was a ghost. Not just around the world. We got people in <laughs> the United States that are like that. And, uh, and there's people that will fall for anything. They're gullible. They're, they're ignorant. And I don't mean that even, even making fun of them or slamming them. It's just the truth. They just don't understand how things work. And this all comes from a lack of knowledge uh, about that and believing stories, charms, curses. I mean... Uh, the history of the Catholic Church, you follow that and you see how these, uh, uh, these, they went into like these heathen lands and they just began to basically enforce Christianity upon them. And next thing you know, like they're just taking their pagan practices, yep. calling it Christianity. And what are they doing? They got beads, right? Prayer beads. You know, that's like a good luck charm, man. They're, they're burning, burning candles to these idols and all this kind of stuff. Man, that's like yep. just good luck charms. They're ignorant. They're gullible. Somebody comes in and says, no, this is what you got to do. Makes it hard to preach the gospel, though, because they're like, no, no, no. You know, my mom taught me this or somebody told me. And they've got all these customs and the traditions, uh, you know, where uh, they fell for certain stories and they believed in charms and supernatural, superstitious type things. Okay, And so the bottom line here is that we need, number one, to be educated, not so educated, <laughs> not you know, I went to Bible college. I went to two different Bible colleges. I'm telling you, there's some people there that that they got so educated that all of a sudden they didn't believe the Bible anymore. <laughs> they got so educated that they could, you know, correct the Bible. <laughs> that is always blowing my mind. I mean, well, you know, how arrogant do you have to be to be like, well, our King James translators incorrectly translated that, you know, because we're so far superior. I've been to college for two years, <laughs> you know, and so we need to we but we need to be educated. You know, we don't need to be, the whole world sees us, you know, we're, we live in an age where it's pretty easy to get some information. 
If you might not believe it if you're on Facebook, but you really can find you can find out facts pretty fast, pretty quickly. Well, I don't know. Now they're uh, they're uh, hiding everything from you on this, <laughs> online. But anyway, uh, they are man. It's scary. <laughs> they're scary. It's hard to find you know like uh, uh, free thinking anymore. They're really limiting that. Uh, I didn't realize how true that was. Anyway, I'll get off subject. Look at Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. Here's the other thing we need to do, not just to educate ourselves, but uh, on like the things of the world, which it's not bad to educate yourself on that, but obviously educate yourself on in uh, spiritual things and in the Bible. But then Mark chapter 13, here's a good advice. Mark chapter 13, look at verse 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Take ye heed, watch, and pray, for ye know not when the time is come. For the Son of Man uh, is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and, uh, and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh. All the warnings in the Bible that say there's going to be false prophets. There's going to be people doing signs and wonders. There's going to be shysters out there. There's going to be snake oil salesmen. There's going to be all this kind of thing. Watch, right, and pray for discernment. What did he say in the, in the text we read in Matthew 7? He said, ask and ye shall find, right? I mean, uh, ask and ye shall receive. <laughs> Knock and it shall be, uh, the door shall be opened to you. Okay, so, uh, so what we need to do is we need to be praying. We need to be seeking, and we need to be watching, watching for the signs, watching for, hey, this guy might be tricking me. I know he sounds good. I know Mike Bickle sounds like a nice guy, man, but I'm going to watch. I'm going to test what he says and put, line that up with the Word of God. And see, this is why I love uh, uh, so many of the guys that I've met, you know, who got saved listening to Pastor Anderson's preaching and stuff. That's where a lot of, uh, a lot of that came from, watching documentaries. And, uh, and what they were doing, you find out, they were seeking truth. They're like, you know what? I'm not just going to believe the narrative. I'm not just going to believe everything that I'm being fed. I'm gonna, I want to know the truth. And they began seeking. They were skeptical, you know, to believe everything. Now, look, the world's going to say, ah, you're a conspiracy theorist. You know, ah, you're, you're, you're a nutcase, man. Why don't you just get in line and believe what everybody tells you to believe? No, because, you know, we understand that we need to watch for deceivers. We need to watch for people that are trying to trick us and people are trying to uh, uh, get us to believe something that's not true. We understand that's going to happen. I, it's going to happen more and more as we see the day approaching, it's, and it's going to get uh, uh, really bad with these signs and wonders. We know the, the Antichrist, and he said there will be many Antichrists, and they'll do these signs and wonders, and the Antichrist himself is going to come uh, deceive the whole world and get them to believe a lie. Okay, so we want to be on our guard and not just believe the narrative that we're fed and uh, not worry about people calling us names and all that kind of stuff, right? Number two is wishful thinking, right? Kind of goes, all these kind of go hand in hand a little bit, but so the first one is just gullible people, ignorant people, you know, they're easily deceived, okay? The second thing is wishful thinking. Now, I remember as a kid, you know, thinking, you know, I watch Star Wars, and I'm thinking, man, if I just could think hard enough, man, I could really get that thing to come. It's just got to have faith. You know, I was taught Santa Claus, and even after my parents told me, look, we lied to you. There is no Santa Claus. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I really believe in Santa. I want him to be there. It's wishful thinking, you know. So somebody can even get to this point, and again, this goes to superstition, all this kind of stuff. I remember, again, I'm a I was a little kid, all right, and I was even saved at this time. But I remember, like, uh, uh, reading my Bible, and you know, you get re you get to reading the Bible, you get distracted on all kinds of things, and your thoughts going, or you read the uh, the footnotes, <laughs> like you talked about, right? But I remember doing this, like, I really want to know God's will for this matter, and it's always something, you know, stupid, like, you know. Should I date that girl or shouldn't? No, I'm just kidding. I really want to know. And so I was like, how do I? And I'm thinking like, this is like the eight ball. You know, like the, you remember those eight balls? You shake them up and says, should I go there? And I was like, no, I don't think so. And you're like, no, that's not the answer I wanted. <laughs> Two out of three. <laughs> and so I remember thinking like, here's what I'm going to do. God, you know, show me the answer. My finger's going to point on a certain thing. And it, 
<laughs> I would just come up with this weird stuff as a kid. And if it didn't work for me, I'd be like, oh, I know what I did wrong. And I would just keep on going until I got the answer that I wanted. That's stupid, but you got to understand a kid doing that kind of stuff. But you know, adults do it all the time. It's like, I really want that to be true. They'll interpret scripture like that. It's like, well, I, that's not what I want the scripture to say. So they'll start twisting it and making it say all these kinds of things. Look, it's called wishful thinking. So if I wanted to deceive a lot of people, man, I would get them to, you know, I would be trying to feed them the stuff that they want to hear. I'd be like, you know what? Don't you want to be rich? Don't you want to be healthy? Look, if you really believe and you send $9.99 to my ministry, <laughs> I'll pray for you. And I'm telling you, you'll be here. I remember watching a documentary on Benny Hinn. A wicked man. He's wicked. I, I don't. I mean, just you can. You can. If you can trust your own eyes, just look at him. Should tell you that. But anyway, <laughs> wicked man. And and I watched this, and you could see this. The I don't even think. I don't even know. I don't think know that this guy that made this documentary was a, was a, a believer, but he was following up on the uh, faith healing, you know, uh, fraud, and he was like, you know, interviewing these people that were really into it. And they might have a son that's crippled or something like that. And they're like, no, we take them uh, all the time. We take them to the service. We're just waiting for that day that Benny Hinn will actually be able to, you know, lay his hands on him. And, and I mean, they just followed him. And, I mean, I watched this documentary and just thought, oh, it was so obvious how wicked the guy was and the things he said. And he would lead it up, you know, to this real emotional time. And all the music would be just right in the background. Yeah, I've, seen, I've been to Baptist churches that do that too, by the way. <laughs> and you get everything just developing this mood and this atmosphere. And then he's like, all right, now it's time to take the offering. And so he would say, now some of you guys, you have really big needs. You have big problems that need to be solved. And so, you know, big problems are going to take some big action. <laughs> and so if you look in the uh, tithing envelopes in front of you or whatever, <laughs> you know, and I mean, you know, if you ever seen one of those kind of like donation things and they're like, hey, give $5, give $20. It was like, give $1,000, give $10,000. It was ridiculous. Well, you got big faith. You have to have big faith if you want your prayers answered. And I was just like, good grief. How could so many people be deceived? But, you know, all over the world, people are deceived. And they'll be like, no, no, no. He's not. It, I mean, it was of God. I'm promising you it was God. And I'm thinking, no, it's, <laughs> you're, being, you're being deceived. It's wishful thinking. There is a God, but you know what? We go off what the Word of God says, and we don't have to like wish and hope for something different. We say, God, what is your will? What is your will? I'm not going to have preconceived ideas about what you want from me or what you're going to bless me with because I wish for that and I really want that. I'm going to say, what does the Bible say? And I'm going to go to that. We need uh, a standard. We need something by which we can say, hey, uh, if God said... You're going to be deceived. There's going to be false prophets. There's going to be all this. You know, you, you, you be skeptical. Skeptical. you got to watch. Well, how am I going to know what's right and what's wrong? So God says, I gave you my standard. I gave you the final authority so that you can line all that up and see. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. <clears throat> I think I got this one right. 1 Thessalonians 4, and let's look at verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with, with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, that's the part I want you to notice, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Now look, as Bible believers, as Christians, we read the Bible and we know there are a lot of things that we have to remind people to give them hope, right? We need to say, hey, look, you're going to go through trials on this earth. The Bible promised that. But, but God, you know, will give you the grace and he'll give you peace. We're going to say those kinds of things. And so, so we do say things to help encourage people. 
We do say things that are like, hey, keep your head up, you know, keep following the Lord. He's going to do this and he's going to do that. But we just don't feed them what they want to know. <laughs> you know, anything that they want to believe, they just want to believe it. So we tell them that. No, we tell them the truth. And then when, regardless of how hard they think that is, we say, but look, God's word is right. And we encourage them in the Lord. We encourage them in the Bible. We don't have to uh, feed them a bunch of stuff that they don't uh, want to believe. Here's another example. Second Peter 3, 8. 2 Peter 3, verse 8 says, But beloved, and this is in regards to those that say, Hey, where is the Lord? You know, and they scoff and they laugh and say, Hey, you think the Lord's coming back? Where is He? But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Uh, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, who are not willing that any should perish, uh, but that all should come to repentance. And we read uh, these verses and we say, you know, hey, don't worry. <laughs> he is going to come back. Now, we don't even, we're not even feeling tribulation. We're not even feeling the hardship, persecution that's going to come, right? But even in that time, we can comfort one another and say, hey, don't worry. Keep your head up, you know, and, and, and encourage people in the Lord. We don't have to feed them a bunch of stuff about, no, no, you're never going to have problems in this earth. If you just follow God, all your financial, fi financial problems will be, you know, you'll be healed. And then you just build all these people up, and eventually in their life, they're like, you know what? I've been for a long time just praying that my back would be healed, and I'm still having back problems. And they're like, I just don't think God answers prayers, and they just quit. You ever met anybody like that? I've met people who went to Bible college, said they were saved, said they believed the gospel and all that. And then later on in life, they were like, you know what? I just don't believe it anymore. I'm like, well, what made you change your mind? Well, I just kept praying for something, and God never gave it to me, so I just don't think he's real. And I'm like, man, you never had, your faith was never in the God of this Bible. Your faith was in, I want this experience. I want the wishful thinking, you know. So wishful thinking is another way that people are deceived. Third thing, again, all these closely related, one leads into the other, but the last one is this, tolerance and self-affirmation. You know, they want, people want to be tolerated, you know, for their beliefs, and they want to have everything that they do. Someone say, hey, you know, if that's what if that's the way you feel, you know, if that's what makes you feel good, just do, you know, the pursuit of happiness. We all want the pursuit of happiness, right? And so uh, we can play on that. If I was going to deceive somebody and try to win a bunch of people to myself, you know, I would really play on that. And I would give them self-affirmation and say, hey, don't worry. I mean, that might not be exactly what I believe, but if that's what you believe and you're really sincere, you know, <laughs> I, I, you, I, you guys are soul winners and you understand how this happens, but you knock on a lot of doors. I've heard that answer a lot of times. Well, I just think whatever it is you believe in, you know, if you really believe it and you're really sincere, like you'll go to heaven. I'm like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I, I, I don't think I've ever been that tactless, but <laughs> that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You either, you either believe that you're right. Most of us believe we're right or else we would believe something else. <laughs> you either believe you're right yeah, and other people are wrong, or you believe nobody's right. Like, I actually have more respect for the person that's like, hey, I'm just kind of agnostic on the thing. Like, I don't know. I don't know. You know, at least they're being honest, and they're like, I, or, or you say, how do you know for sure you're going to heaven? I have more respect for someone's like, I don't think anybody, you think anybody could know, right? Because they're just, they're just saying, I think probably everybody's wrong, you know? Rather than the person who just, you know, well, I just think, you know, what's good for you is good for you, and, and your way leads to heaven, and this way leads to heaven. No, you, there's no way you can believe that. You believe that you're right, or you believe nobody's right. Or what's the other one? <laughs> you say, you believe that you're right, you believe that nobody's right. What am I saying? Yeah, that's it. Thank you. But you, can, yeah, that's Facebook post. A little pre, you know, <laughs> give you a little taste of the sermon. So, but you can't believe that everybody's right. That's, that's, that's stupidity. There's no way that two people can be right when they're saying two entirely different things. Okay? And so this, but our world has been fed that. Well, if you really believe that, you know, that's what, if that's what, you know, where you find your happiness, you know, then you just go after that. You know, don't let me stop you. I can't tell you, you know, I, I don't judge. And the other, the other fallacy about that is that here's what it actually... Tolerance, tolerance is such a facade. Nobody's really tolerant. What they mean is, I want you to be tolerant of me. 
<laughs> and people that are like me or my friends or my family or whatever. But everybody's got something that they're not tolerant of, okay? It's usually independent fundamental Baptist. <laughs> <coughs> So let me just conclude by saying this. I think that the charismatic movement as a whole, from its very inception, okay, which goes back to the holiness movement, all right, the holiness movement, which is kind of like a, t- a spin off of the uh, John Wesley, you know, what became Methodist. But there was a group of people that just, man, uh, they just really had to afflict themselves and they had to give everything up. And they're, you know, they would spend large amounts of time fasting and praying and they wanted something you know, big to happen. And so they just kept on fasting and kept on praying and all that. Now, every wave, that's the first wave, okay? That's where Pentecostalism started, all right? The second wave of the charismatic movement is uh, where they kind of stopped saying uh, uh, Pentecostal, and it just kind of became this, um, you know, all these other uh, denominations were also accepting spirit, uh, spirit filled, so quote unquote, you know, speaking in tongues and all this. Basically, they just started leaning more towards the signs and the, and the prophecies and speaking in tongues. Okay. And then the third wave is what we're in now. It's kind of some people call it like neo charismatic movement. And basically, what this is saying is total, they call it non denominational, but it's really interdenominational. They're saying, hey, we're all going to hold hands. I don't care if you're Catholic. I don't care if you're whatever. If you believe in Jesus and you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you show signs and wonders and all this stuff, man, we're, you know, we're all together, right? And so every wave, every, every different wave, I think, has, has uh, used these uh, three different ways of preying upon the ignorant and the gullible, Right now, some people, I believe, fell into it because they seriously, you know, believed that it was true. They, you know, but at the top of that, I can pretty much guarantee you there was some false prophet that was trying to lead people astray. And, you know, you see picture of this guy and he's like, well, man, I've been fasting for 21 days. And so uh, and so the Lord finally showed me. I mean, the power comes when you're willing to fast for 21 days. And I'm like, you've been fasting for 21 days. Why do you got a belly like that? <laughs> See, I'm not ignorant. <laughs> I can see you're lying, right? Because this is what they're, they're just, uh, they're just deceiving all these people to say that there's some holy person and they got some special revelation from God and they just uh, deceive all these people, okay? And, uh, and then the wave of the charismatic movement, you see the 80s, uh, everybody just kind of loved this feel good, uh, you know, do what you want to do, sing whatever kind of music you want to sing and all this kind of stuff. Hey, man, this was this tolerance, you know, and in and, 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 and each of these types of deception, I think, have been seen in all of these uh, uh, different waves of the charismatic movement. They prey on the ignorant who can't explain their tricks. No, no, you saw it with your own eyes. They, I healed that person from the dead. You know, the gullible people said, wow, that's amazing. And they'll go to their, their deathbed saying, no, I saw it with my own eyes. Benny Hinn raised that person from the dead, you know, because they're gullible. People who believe certain things and they just really, really want them to happen, you know, like a superstitious uh, a belief, they'll fall prey to this uh, charismatic movement. And then uh, uh, this movement also continues to grow, like I said, to this day, because they're breaking down barriers. And they're, they're very, very intelligent. If you watch their model, it's like, it's like a, I mean, these guys, some of these guys are probably CEOs of major companies, and they know how to do the marketing. They know how to team up with the right people and, you know, this, and start these, like, uh, franchise-type churches all over the world. And if you watch the, these non-denominational, charismatic-type uh, um, churches, if you want to call them that, these movements, that are spreading, that are like, you know, popping up all over, you know, man, it's just this one big business model, you know, of how to get these people to come and to buy my books and to do all this kind of stuff. They're very, very uh, crafty at what they do. And, uh, and so this is, this is the danger, you know, of their very calculated, uh, uh, you know, the, the popular music, the trends of the day, you know, using the right kind of lighting and the right kind of look. We can use some of those things, don't get me wrong, but to the extent where you're just, you know, you're, you're selling people to your brand, you're selling them to, you know, what they really want to be a part of, something big. Hey, that's all tactics, you know, trying to deceive. And so we need 
do our best to make sure we're not deceived. Now, if we're saved, I think, you know, that we're, we're obviously way ahead of the world. But not only that, but we need to try to make sure the world's not deceived, you know, which means, and I don't know how to do this exactly. Maybe just pray about a way to, uh, that we can, we can do this. I know we're talking about, you know, uh, doing some more uh, research and putting something out on IHOP KC. But, uh, but we need to make sure that other people aren't falling to this, falling into the uh, uh, non-denominational uh, type stuff. Because, look, when we, even when we knock on doors and somebody gives the right answer, we just got to believe in Jesus Christ, you know, it's hard because sometimes you're like, well, they said they gave the right answer. They must be saved. And you don't even know like the church that they're going to is feeding all this garbage and they're believing all these uh, these crazy things. And we need to we need to do something to get people from being deceived because the Bible warns us there's going to be many false prophets and people deceiving us. We don't want them to be deceived. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you that you've saved us. Thank you that you've given us your word and you've given us the Holy Spirit. In discernment, of course, we uh, need to walk in the Spirit, and we need to study, and we need to uh, show ourselves approved, Lord. But I pray that you would help us as a church and individually in our own lives not to be deceived and, uh, and to be uh, uh, wise and educated in the way that we present the gospel and the way that we uh, handle those who are uh, uh, ignorant or uh, they are just kind of convincing themselves about something that they really, really want to believe, give us wisdom, Lord. We ask for that. We ask you to help us to understand how to deal with these types of people as we see more and more of them uh, all the time. And I, and I pray that you'll lead and direct and have your will and way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.